back and review. All right, so going to do a little coding practice, do a little warm up, and then uh, any questions on some chapter nine things. Let's first do a quick little warm up. One of my favorite websites, you know the site, codingbat.com. Here is a proposed problem. I have solved it on one line. That doesn't mean you have to solve it on one line. How would you approach this problem? You have a string given to you. STRR is the string variable name that they give you for it. You want to return rotated left to. What in the world do they mean by that? Well, I get the first two characters are moved to the end of the string. String length will be at least two. So we don't have to do any error checking to see whether they've given a, st a string shorter than two. So you first look at that problem and think, man, how do I solve that? What do they mean by this? And then we can think to ourselves, well, how do I get the first two characters? Let's just think about that too. Don't worry about anything else. Just how do I get the first two characters of a string? Anyone want to help me out with that? How do I get the first two characters of a string? Take it. You don't have to get the whole thing. What? What? Would char at work? Char at gives me one character. I could get char at zero and char at one and put them together. That would work. So I could use char at. So I could use dot char at. Uh, not parenthesis. I could use char at. Parenthesis zero. Concatenate with that char at. At parenthesis one. That would give me the first two characters. I know of another way, and and this char at zero and one will give me the first two. One of my favorite ones, substring. Substring zero comma two will give me the first two as well. So both of those will give me the first two characters. Okay, so that's part of our notes, comments. That will give us our first two. What will give us the last, the remaining? bring that up for a year. The remaining part of our string. How about the last three and the rest characters three all the way to the rest of it. I'll call it the last part. Anyway, any idea how I get the last part of a string? What do you think, Naif? How would I get the last part of a string starting at the third character and then the rest of the string? So if it were hello, it gives me hello. Any idea? I'll give you a clue. Substring will do it. Any idea there, Naive? I'm not really sure, Professor. Okay. Substring of any string starting at a starting position without any other parameter gives me Starting at that character all the way to the right, all the way to the end. So knowing those two things, I'm going to give you, I'll use the char at. Well, I'm going to return. And I'm not even going to have a temporary variable. I'm just going to say return. Well, the last part is going to be put in front of the first two, right? I take the last part of the string. And it's going to begin with the third character all the way to the end. And then the first and second characters are going to be tacked on to the right side. So rotating left. So I'm going to return stir.substring starting at location two. That's the end of the string. Concatenate on the first two characters. I'm going to use the dot char at stir.char at zero and also stir dot char at one. I know that I could also do this. Give me the first two characters. Let's see if I got it right. I notice I didn't have to make a temporary variable and I'll do that only when I have what I think is a 
reasonably short solution that will fit on one line, then I'll just put it right there in the return, not worry about having a string and building it up. Well, here comes the moment of truth. Ta-da, you got the right answer. Let's just verify that substring two will also give us the right, or substring zero comma two will also give us the right answer. Let's just comment this one out and also do the other answer. Return, oops, return. Third dot substring two, that's starting at the second character, or the third character, remember it's zero, one, two in the character numbers. And catenate on stir dot substring Starting at character zero, ending before character two. Oh, and don't forget my ending parenthesis. I don't think I actually have to have that that outside parenthesis. This also gives you the right answer. Let's remove that outside parenthesis. I don't actually have to have return parenthesis. I can just say return this. Let's verify. That's also good. It doesn't hurt to throw in parentheses, but they aren't absolutely required. So either of these will give you the answer. Some people might like this because it's less typing using the same function substring, which is kind of a general purpose. But if you think to yourself, well, the first two characters are yeah, char at zero and char at one, that's also a perfectly valid answer. A little more to type, but will also give us the right answer. Well, I can challenge my friends to say, okay, you have to use substring and char at can't just use substring to give you their answer. Another challenge to give yourself. Great way to practice. And these, let's check their solution. Just for learning, again, remember learning coding is seeing how other people might do it. I'm guessing that they like the substring answer. Let's see what they suggest for a solution. Yep, they like the substring answer. So a great place to go and if you get stumped, they often either give you their solution or they give you a hint at their solution. OK, so let's go back then. Uh, any questions about the Chapter 9 problem? I'm going to bring up my Eclipse. And take a look. You're stuck at all, or I, I don't know if I'll give you the full answer, but I might explain the loop that we did on Friday. Let's see, there's my workspace. Clip should be coming up in a second with my Chapter 9 project that I left you to solve part of that. If I remember right, you were going to find the biggest, the min and max, or the largest or smallest, what was that? You got the sum of digits. Oh, and we also write, we need to also write a max digit and a min digit. To display the highest and lowest digits in the string. First of all, let's review this little solution right here to sum of digits. I know it works because my solution test runs and I get the answer, right? I get the sum of digits when I run it, I'm waiting for it to run. I get the sum of digits of 2514 does come out to be 7 plus 1 plus 4 equals 12. But let's review why this works. I need to have a loop that goes from 0 to one less than the total length of my string because I'm planning to do a char at of each of those characters. And this little variable I is going to be, what I'm calling it my index variable into my string. Since I want one character at a time, I want I to be the variable that's going to be zero, one, two, three, however long my string is minus one, because remember the character zero is the first character of a string. Length minus one is the location of the last character of the string. So let's look at this for loop right here. Three pieces in a for loop. 
the variable that we call our typically call our county variable. And this is the way I generally write my for loops. I could have declared I before I come to the for loop, but I like declaring it right in here because it's nice and cl clean right on one line. But this is saying my variable I is the counting variable inside this for loop. This variable I was going to start with zero and keep going in through my loop while this is true. And before I come back and do the thing again inside my loop, I increment I by one. That's a shorthand term way of saying I equals I plus one. Because we're incrementing variables so much, they've invented this for many languages, not just Java, that I equals I plus one as it's the same as just saying I plus plus. And because sometimes I want to increment I before looking at its value, I sometimes can do plus plus I. That's also valid. This is called a post increment pre increment. This is what we use most of the time. I don't think I have ever used this. Um, but it's valid for saying increment I. And if I want to use I before I increment it, usually I do this. Take a look at I, increment it by one. And then do the thing in the loop again. You want to take a look at how we might do a max digit of a string? Anyone like to take a look at that? Just to give you a hint. I think Jalen, you got this one? Or should I give you a little help? I might be a little help. All right. Well, here's my plan. Since this method here already does sum of digits going through one digit at a time, I'm going to use the same code I do here. And instead of calculating the sum, I'm just going to keep track of the minimum digit. So I'm going to copy paste this code right below here give him a different name. I'm going to call him max digit. Max digit. And instead of keeping track of the sum, I'm going to call it uh, L min digit. Or sorry, L max digit. How oh, about we just call L max? We don't need to get long variables. L max equals, well, we don't want to set it equal to zero because I might have a I might have, well, let's see, the digits are going to be 0 to 9. I guess I could say L max is equal to 0 at the start. So we'll assume 0 is our largest digit before we start our loop. You just put a if loop under the 4 one. 4. Yeah, I'm going to put an if right inside of here. Yeah. I'm not going to do any, any uh, converting, but I do need to pull the digit so I can compare it to L max. So at this time, I guess I do need a temporary location. I'll call it, how about I call it, uh, I'll get rid of that extra comment here. I don't need extra comments always coming with me. I'll call it uh, long L this digit. So each time through the loop, I'm going to be grabbing the digit. And let's see, let's start this digit. Instead of leaving it, with an unknown value. Let's have it be the integer value of the first digit in our string. We're going to say and character zero. So this digit is initially the value of the first digit in our string, caret zero. And now, since I want to now compare one at a time, so I'll put a loop here, loop to find largest compared to this. Well, instead of starting at zero, I'm going to count from the next digit up, keep going to the length of my string. And instead of doing this, I'm going to add it to a sum. I'm going to say uh, oh, let's do this. Uh, this digit is that one. 
let's now say L max equals L this digit. Now let's compare inside this loop each digit as I compare to the max. So let's do this now inside the loop. Instead of L sum equals, I'm going to say this. This digit is now the next digit in the loop. Let's call it character at position I. Each position, as I counts from the position one all the way to the end of the string, grab the digit, convert it. That's what parse int. Remember this, I'm cool comment here. Convert to an integer. That's all parsint is doing for me, is converting a character to an integer. Now we do the compare. If Lmax is less than L this digit, what should I do? Set Lmax to... Yeah. I found a new max. Lmax equals L this digit. And if I go through my loop, if I never find anything larger than my current L max that I started with, which was digit zero, well, I know I have found L max, and instead of returning L sum, I return L max. So you have to convert it, and then? Yeah, because remember, we're given a string. Oh, okay. Our input is something like a string, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we could parse that whole thing and, and become 1,234,567. Uh -huh. Or I say, wait a minute, I want the value treated as a number one at a time. First, the first digit I converted into a value in order to be able to do mathematical comparison. I am allowed to actually do a less than comparison with strings, but that alphabetical instead of mathematical. So this says convert the first character, convert uh, char zero, char at zero, that's the first character, first char, to an integer. That's what this line here is doing. And to make it clear, I'm going to move my comment above it just because it's getting kind of a long line there. For the first character at integer, my current max, one before the loop, or the loop, max is first char. I'll call it the first char value. Now in my loop, I'm going to start at the next character all the way to the end. Convert that character to an integer and then do the comparison. And again, to make it a little easier, put a little white space in there if it makes it easier. Compare and if I ever do this, I know I have a new max. It is max digit, right? So now, do you think you could do min digit without any help? Go to the, if you want to rewrite it just to help you understand it, that's not bad. But you could just copy paste this and just change a tiny bit of the code, renaming it and maybe renaming the variable just to avoid confusion to do L min digit. I'll give you a clue. If you're going to do L min digit, Besides maybe renaming variables, the only thing that changes is this little piece right here. I'm comparing instead of L max is less than the L this digit, I'm going to be comparing L min. Have I found a digit that's smaller than L min? So that might change the direction. Otherwise, it's almost exactly the so it's going to be exactly the same loop, getting at each character at a time in the string. 
this is the only mural piece I would change to make it a min digit. Think you have enough that you could do your own min digit? Yeah. All right. And again, if you get stuck at all, you can send an email, check online. But this is the key part here. When I do loops, I like to do this format of loops. Nice and small. Declare my loop variable. Set it equal to one in this case. This is the how how long what what determines that I keep going in my loop. And some change in I each time through the loop. So I know when I'm how my loop is changing each time through. All right, so time for a little bit of a new topic here, chapter 10. We'll be talking about a more general object oriented subject of class inheritance. Class inheritance is more of how object oriented programming organizes our code, it helps us to be better reusable code. And this young guy explained it pretty well, so I'm going to let you sit, watch this video. I thought he did a pretty good job. Let's see how this guy tries to explain inheritance. And I'm going to begin. I'm not going to be coming. He has some ads at the start. I'm going to start maybe right right here. He's going to be creating a little a thing called a a game or a gaming mouse. I'm not even sure what a gaming mouse is. Let's find out his thoughts on a gaming mouse. Here we go. Project. So we'll go to file new class. And in this video, we're going to work on three of them. Just because five is going to be too many. So we'll call it like mouse one. Finish. And we'll make two more. Mouse two. And mouse three. So we've got our three mouse classes here. I'm just going to remove the main method. That was an accident. So they should all be empty classes like this. And don't worry, we'll get to inheritance in a second. So he's making three different kinds of mice. They're going to be used in some program. And a lot of and mice do a lot of the same thing. Let's see how inheritance will help us write code. Now, when I have three things that are very similar, I can use inheritance to make me more efficient coding. Let's see how he does it. But first, let's just start making these mouse objects and start making them pretty cool. We'll say one mouse is like a cool matte black texture. We can set the texture equal to matte. Of course, it has left and right click, so we'll make some methods like left click and just right click blank. just for laying out the organization of your class and for simplicity's sake we'll just print out click like that in each of them but mouse one also has another cool feature it's also got some some rgbs on it so we can set a certain color and we can say which color and we'll print out that it's that color. This is just example code, it's not actually doing anything. Really. Let's go on over to mouse two. It can also do left click, right click. So I'm just going to copy these over. And let's say its special feature that makes it stand out is that it's Bluetooth. So we can have a method like connect and we can connect to Bluetooth. A lot of these examples, they just do prints just to show you how the code is. And finally, mouse three also knows left click, right click. Again, copying and pasting so we'll the copy same and paste code over three here. Times. Not very efficient. But its special feature is that it's ambidextrous. So we'll actually just have that like maybe as a property here and say Boolean ambidextrous equals true. Something like that. So we've got three mouses here, each slightly different. 
they all know how to left click, right click. And so repeating this code a lot can be pretty redundant, just makes it difficult to keep track of. And if our company grew and we had to make a hundred different mice in a year, then copying and pasting this a hundred times is not gonna make the code any easier to read. Work. So we can make as many mice as we want that have different features by making a generic mouse that has the basics like left click and right click. So to do that, we'll just go to new class again and we'll just call this mouse. This and hit finish. Inherited and our generic mouse is gonna have everything that all of our mice is gonna have. And all of our mice are gonna have left click, right click. So we can just take that and put it in here. So that way, it doesn't need to be in mouse one, it doesn't need to be in mouse two, and it does not need to be in mouse three. Make sure all of these are saved. And let's say also all of our mice are gonna have a scroll wheel. So we can do the same thing. Let's scroll up, scrolled up, and scroll down. In real life, these would be implemented like there'd be code in here, like if statements and for loops and parameters, but it wouldn't be as easy to show in the console here in a second when everything comes together. So now we have our generic mouse that can left click, right click, scroll up and scroll down. We can create a ton of other mice based on this and that's called inheritance. And to do inheritance is super simple. You just go up to the name of your first mouse and do extends mouse. Okay, let's think about that. That's what this is telling you right here is that this is a new class I'm calling mouse one it has all the methods that are built into the what we'll call the generic mouse. See how he explains it. Okay, seems pretty easy. Let's just do that to mouse two. And, mouse. and also mouse three. Now, if we created a main method here to see what's all going on and hit us public static void so we can run our code. If we create our first mouse, mouse one, call it m1 equals new mouse one. If we do m1 dot, we can see everything that that mouse one can do. And we can see that it has a texture and it can also left click, right click, scroll down and scroll up. Even though, even though when we go to mouse one, we don't see scroll up or scroll down, but since it extends mouse, these two keywords mean inherit, since it inherits from the generic mouse, it knows everything already. And that's why it knows left click, it knows right click, and it can also scroll down and scroll up. Even though all and if we run this, we'll actually see those methods being called. Click, click, scrolls down, scrolled up. And this happens too with all of them. So if we change this to mouse two, the same exact thing would happen. Two, 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 two. And there you go. But we also have the property specific to mouse two. We see connect, the method connect. Since mouse two is Bluetooth, we can do m2 dot connect like that. And now we see that connected message. But we can't, for example, get a texture because there's no texture in mouse two. There's only a texture in mouse one. So what this does is it lets us create a generic object and then we can create a bunch of different variations of it and keep track of it a lot simpler. And this is basically how everything is made when you think about it. A car company, for example, has a lot of different cars, a lot of different models. Have you ever heard them say a car platform? Like the new BMW is on this new X7 wide platform. The platform is the generic object. The BMW 5 series platform can make a luxury version of that car 
or a sports version of that car, a high performance version of that car, but each version of the car can drive or roll the windows down generic things. So I hope this was helpful. I tried to do it simply, but I realized I may have overcomplicated a little bit, but let me know if this mouse example was useful for you. I thought he did a pretty good job explaining inheritance. Think of the uh, efficiency of writing code. Rather than having three mice that had their own left click right click scroll up scroll down we put all those methods in a platform for a mouse the generic things that all mice do and then each of the special versions that has something special beyond just the regular mouse we just say okay this class does what a mouse does with these extra things. It has a texture and I can set some color. This one, oh, that's mouse one. Let's just, uh, what do you do with the others? The others have a, another method, but still all the methods that came with the generic mouse. Now think now if I ever have to fix my code, or test my code, or change it, I don't have to go to multiple places where all I copied all the left click, right click for my special mice. If, if left click is broken, it's only broken right here, and I can fix the code in one place. If I decide to behave differently, this is the only place I need to go to fix the code, rather than, oh, let's fix the left click for this kind of mouse and this kind. If they're all using the same super class, that's what we call this, the super class that these guys have inherited, all I have to do is fix this code in one place and all my mice are now fixed. But also there's also the danger of if I break my code here, I have broken all my mice. But see how this is more efficient? Instead of multiple copies of code, I can have this code, general purpose code, in the parent class or the super class, and these three classes inherit that. Now in the book, they look at a different kind of, of uh, example having to do with employees. So let's take a look as we think of that through that first programming pro project an employee and a production worker. I'm going to go. I'm going to jump right to the to the homework project and just look at this very first one as we design our own super class is a generic employee. Every employee in a company is going to have a name, employee number, hire date, and uh, the shift and hourly pay rate. A production worker is going to be a regular employee plus some extra fields that only production workers need to worry about. So let's write the employee class and then we'll think of how a production worker would inherit employee class and add whatever extra information they want us to add. Well, I'm not even going to worry about production work yet. I'm going to follow the specs given to me for this generic employee. So from this, I'll go, I guess I'll put this on the right side. From this, let's go to Eclipse and start a project for Chapter 10 and build this generic employee class. So I'm going to close my previous one, saving all my answers so far, saving that in my project nine. And remember, in my project, once I have it working, you can right click on your project and you can do an export. That will send it to a zip file underneath general archive file. And that's the file then that you can upload 
for the submitting of the homework. So I'm going to start a chapter 10, throwing my name in there, new Java project. I'm going to call it Manning chapter 10. Same default settings. I just like to see what they are and finish. I'm going to let it create a module info file that we don't really care about yet. And now let's create. I don't I don't even need to look at module info. Let's create a class named employee. And they've given us what I need to put in the employee class. And let me give this some room here so I can view it instructions while I write my code. All right, I don't need to see this right now. And let's create a new class. File, class. Oh, let me do this in the right place. Otherwise, it doesn't give the right fill in. I'm going to right click on my project, Chapter 10, right click there, new class. When I do it this way, it fills in my source and package information for me. And then there's less confusion later on. Name of my class is employee. Not going to have any main in there. I'll have a main for testing all of this. So my employee class I'm creating. This is something that, because I'm part of a package, that line needs to be in there. Eclipse does that for me. And let's define our standard employee class. So I'm really not doing any inheritance yet. I'm defining what every employee, any any class that extends the employee class will have this available employee name now i'm going to practice keeping these variables these fields private and have accessor and mutator getters and setters just for practicing building a class with good getters and setters i'm going to make this all private private okay. Employee name. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna use my preferred way of naming variables. I'm gonna call it S name. And private. Let's see. Employee number. It's gonna be numbers and letters. So I'm gonna make it a string. I'll call it. Although it's S. It's a they have a number in the name of it, I'm going to call it mpnum. And I'm going to put in comments, it's something like xxs-l. You know what, since that's a digit, I'm going to put that digit there. I'm going to say 999-l. So 9 representing a digit 0 to 9. Something like that. And the higher dates. Private. Now there are date variables in in Java I believe um, let's just let's see doesn't didn't say let's just put let's see should I make it a date let's see is there a date I'll call it a higher date I want to use a date class I think there is one if I hover over this I'll see that oh there is a java.util date I'm going to try using that, and if it if I have problems, I'll change it to a string. But I kind of like learning how to use the date class. They didn't say you had to; they just said keep track of higher dates. But I'm going to I'm going to use the date class that I know was in there. And what's more, shift. Well, they told us the the, the uh, type of variable for that: an integer and an hour and pay rate. So we'll do uh, integer. A private integer int shift int shift worker shift and I think it's shift one or two right day is one night is two and hourly pay rate is a double so private double uh, what we call pay rate. Uh, 
There we go. Those are the fields. And I'm skipping the uh, comments here. I'll put in here a to do editor comments, your name, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's my employee class. This is going to be the things that every employee is going to be using. So I'm going to put a little comment here. I'll call it uh, the generic class for all types of employees. And I'm going to say subclass uses it thusly. I'm not sure if that's a real word. Uh, public class employee type one extends employee. That's how this employee class gets used by other subclasses. And I throw that in my comments just to remind me this is how it would be used. Extends employee means any subclass that extends employee will have these things in it, but they won't be accessible until I build my accessor and mutators. Let's build our accessor and mutators. I like to call them my getters and setters. Let's write our get name. Public string get name return yes name. It seems silly that we need to do this, but if we follow this practice, as we build more complex code, we'll know that anytime I'm accessing the name that goes through this function right here, nowhere else. So if then anything goes wrong, I know to come fix the code right here for getting the name. Let's do the set name, public string set name. Now some people like to put all their getters together and all their setters together, but I like to kind of group them by the uh, field that they're dealing with. Oh, and set name needs to know what, what name to set it to, so we send it a string s and we'll just say s name equals s. Simple getters and setters, oh public, I forgot to do public void string, there we go. Oh, what am I talking about? Public void set name, there we go. This returns a name, this sets a name and does not return anything. So I'll leave it to you to uh, set the others. You do the rest. You can do the set employee number, get employee number, and other, it says, what does it say? Appropriate accessor and mutator methods. So I'm saying you should at least have, I'll put, I guess I'll show you in comments. You should have a uh, set mp num, get mp num. I guess I'll help you write the constructor. Usually we put the constructor first. It's your choice, but most of the time we like to write the constructor before all our getters and setters in our good code organization. So our constructor would just look like this employee and we take a name and a number, I guess, for the employee. S name. I don't want to use the same variable name as the class here. I'll call it S new name and string S new num. There's my constructor, and let's just say, okay, whenever we can give a, uh, start a new employee class, we assign him a name and a number. Basic constructor assigning a name and a number. Hire date, 
Uh, let's see. I suppose in the constructor, I could say, you know, when, when I create an employee, let's just say hire date equals date dot. Is there a date now? Uh, there's a UTC. Or is there a time? System time. Let's try. Let's try system dot. Is there a time? Get. How do I get the current time? Let's do a quick check to see how could I get the current system date and time. And rather than guess at it, I'm gonna do. I guess I'll bring over here. I'm gonna do a search for Java current. And I'll bet you the very first link system. There we go. System dot current time will give me milliseconds. I guess that'll work. And I can always get their current time and convert it to a date. So system dot current time millis. Or is there another way to just get the date? New date. There we go. Gate equals new date. Oh, there's formatters. Local. Local date. There's a get time method. Returns a date object. Sounds like get time will work. Let's try get time. Where was that? System dot get time. Oh. Oh. I'll do their example date. Right. Current time milliseconds. Let's see if that will work. System dot current. Time milliseconds. It returns a long, not a date. And let's see, will that convert it to a date? I don't think it will. Well, higher date. Uh, I was hoping it would be easier. Okay, here we go. Here's how to get the date. New date based on current time. There we go. That's how I want to do date. Given the current time in milliseconds, it will return a date object. There we go. And because I found this answer on a particular website, I'm going to put the link to that because it wasn't obvious right away how to do that. So I'm going to put the link to how I figured out how to get the date. And let's just assume they're on the day shift when we make a new employee. We'll do shift. equals one and pay rates. Let's give them the minimum $15 an hour. And just to make it clear, I'm going to read my code that it is a double. I can do 15.00. I'll call that my default pay. Here is my generic employee class that other classes are going to extend. Now we'll work up some more on this Wednesday. Let's make just real quick. Let's make the production worker. Let's just get the production worker started. So there's my generic employee with lots of other things to do. I've played with the constructor saving that. Now I'm going to make a production worker. New class of my project. Name production worker. Production worker is the name they gave me in the problem statement right here. Production worker. There's the name of my class. And all I do, we'll work on this Wednesday, is my production worker extends employee. A production worker now will have all the same methods in an employee class. Now let's complain a little bit about it needs a 
production worker constructor. We'll work on the constructor, or we can let Eclipse actually help build our constructor. Here's what our production worker constructor will look like. And we'll talk about what this means. Calling the superclass constructor with production worker. But here is how we build a subclass and many other kinds of workers, just like that mouse example. Many other, other workers will have the employee, this standard things that every employee has with extra features for that specific type of job. That's this author's example of using inheritance. Okay, we'll end there. Hope that was helpful, giving that guy, that guy's video kind of explained with mice. The chapter talks about other classes having to do with grading materials in a class. But I'm jumping right to the, you, uh, to the homework Writing this code, I, to me, writing the code myself helps me to understand what they're talking about in the chapter. All right, we'll stop there. Not a lot of work. This is more concepts. We're not solving problems so much as organizing code with this. All right, I will end the recording.